All right, we are back. I'm going to start out with the uh, next comment here, Jay's Judah. Hi, Brian. Do you believe that there are apostles today? Thanks, Jason. Well, let's go in your King James Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28. Okay, it says here, And God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, but covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. And he goes on in chapter 13 to talk about charity. Charity is the bond of perfectness. Um, so whatever gift you have, whatever thing you can do as a Christian, if you have charity with it, that's, you know, whatever God's appointed you to do, as long as you're doing it in charity, you're going to, you know, be successful for the Lord. And I don't mean monetarily successful. Uh, please understand that. But there's two ways of looking at this thing. Um, some people make this into a thing there, verse 28, of kind of a chronological thing. The, the church starts out with the apostles. Now that is true. And then they'll say, okay, then the apostles are gone. And next you have prophets, and then you have teachers. And then after that, miracles, gifts of healings, helps governments, diversities of tongues. But you see, it's kind of a problem because if this is chronological, well, the gifts, the sign gifts were there early on. And later on, they ceased. All right, so it it's kind of a weird way to look at it, saying it's, you know, uh, chronological. Turn it over to uh, Revelation chapter 2. I think it's, I'm trying to think of where this verse is. Um, with the seven churches, there's an interesting thing here. Okay, yeah, Revelation 2, verse 2. It says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and hast and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. All right, and uh, another place Paul talks about the signs of an apostle. And, uh, you know, an, an apostle, I believe, had to be, you know, an actual apostle there had to be a eyewitness of Jesus Christ. They had to do certain miracles and things to really truly be an apostle. So there is a sense of, people trying to be one of the 12 apostles or say that they have the sign gifts of the apostles and you can try them and find them to be liars. Um, but I think that there is another meaning to the word apostle and that is, you know, disciple of Jesus. Uh, the disciples are called apostles at, at one point in time in Scripture in the New Testament. So there's a sense in which, in that sense, you know, we can all be a disciple of Jesus Christ, not the official 12 disciples, um, but we can, you know, the Lord is our, our master, he's our leader, our teacher, so we can be a disciple of his. So um, I would say that an apostle today is a Christian that is serving the Lord, that is dedicated to following the Lord, um, being discipled by the Lord. Um, but that unique 12 apostle um, classification where, you know, Judas Iscariot is replaced by Paul, Paul is the twelfth apostle. Uh, that's a very special number there, and um, you see it back in the book of Revelation, back further on, there, that the names of the twelve apostles are there. So there's not any more room for anybody else getting into that group. Um, but as far as uh, being a disciple of Jesus Christ, also called an apostle, yeah, I think Christians can be and should be that. So yes, they are for today, but uh, this charismaniac kookiness of People going around, I'm the apostle so-and-so. Eh, it's not a title. Um, again, you're not going to see titles in the King James Bible. Um, pastor is a description. It's not a title. Uh, bishop is a description. It's not a title. Uh, we're not supposed to have titles. That's why you call a brother or sister or things like that. Um, we're in the body of Christ. We're family, so that's why you say brother, sister. That's fine. But when you get into religious titles, it's dangerous. I'm going to go down through here. A lot of replies back and forth on that one.
All right. John Gill. Are you going to make a video exposing James White's stupid little book, The King James Only Controversy? Well, um, eventually I'd like to. You know, it's just a matter of, again, putting the thing together. Um, you know, I just simply said about James White, you know, anybody that, that denies the King James Bible and has no perfect standard of truth on this earth other than his own mind, uh, just, I just tell people, yeah, don't, don't follow him. He's not a Bible believer. But it's ironic. Um, I brought out this video saying that James White is a Jesuit and things, and, and uh, or why is James White's book endorsed by a Jesuit, Norman Geisler? And uh, I didn't realize it, but the University of Detroit, I mean, he went to Loyola University, but he also went to um, the University of Detroit. And I did not know that, but that's actually another Jesuit school. So Norman Geisler went to two Jesuit schools. But then somebody else brought up this point, and it's like, I have the book. I didn't even see it on the back. But uh, this book right here, The Forgotten Trinity by James White, right on the back, right there. See if I can get that on camera. Oops, this way. See the F.R. Mitchell Pacwa S.J.? I'm really messing this up. There we go. Assistant Professor, University of Dallas. S.J. is a Society of Jesus. He's a Jesuit. So you have Mitchell, Mitchell Pacwa there endorsing James White's book. And James White puts the endorsement on the book. So an open Jesuit priest. And James White has debated this guy numerous times. And I watched a little bit of the, the beginning of one of his debates. And then James White goes into this big, nice you know, a little homiletical speech, you know, where they, you, you monitor your voice. And when we come to a knowledge of understanding of the truth, we can all see that blah, blah, blah. You know, they, they, they meter their voice and they make it sound really exciting. That's ridiculous nonsense. Again, it goes back to pagan Greek oration and stuff like that, but another study. But it was interesting because James White actually says about how he respects Father Pacwa. You know, and, and he's, because he'll get right to the point and everything else. And uh, James White is a snake. He's a total, complete snake. And, you know, I, I accused him of Jesuitical sophistry, and he's like, he acts like, I don't even know what that is. You know, this, this supposed brilliant scholar, and, and I said about a temporal co coadjutor, and he's like, coadjutor? Coadjutor? What's it? Oh, you know, like he's like, I never heard that term, <laughs> you know. And he's this brilliant scholar. He, he, James White preys on the ignorance of the people that are dumb enough to follow him. That's the whole thing. And he laughs at them. I guarantee you that. Uh, yeah, I do believe the guy's a Jesuit. Definitely. But, uh, you know, this thing of, you know, you meet with a Catholic, you know, a Jesuit. An open Jesuit priest. You know, and, and you, I respect Father Pacwa and stuff like this. The Jesuits are the most satanic group of people on the planet. They're very extremely wicked. I mean, up in British Columbia, they had to pay out, uh, I think it was a couple million dollars in, in damages to the native people up there because the Jesuits were ritually abusing the, the small children in a, in a Catholic school up there. I mean, they're sick, disgusting people. And you look at all the things that the Jesuits have had their hands in and involved in over the centuries, they're very, very bad. So for James White to come out and say, I'm going to debate this Jesuit and I respect him. You know, it's, can you imagine Elijah, you know, back in the Old Testament, you know, with the priests of Baal? I'm here and I respect these priests of Baal very much because of, you know, that's not how Christians deal with their enemies. All right. It's not how Jesus dealt with the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees of his day. So James White is just playing, you know, good cop, bad cop with the Jesuit order. He's one of them. So... Uh, you know, there's another question coming up. I'm going to talk a little bit more about James White. Another, I saw another question, but, um, you know, uh, just, you know, it's kind of like the, the scripture that says about, you know, speak not in the ears of a fool for he will despise the wisdom of thy words. And that's kind of the thing with James White. But, uh, if I ever get around to debunking his book, then yeah, I'll bring that out. But again, other people have, I can point people to, read that, you know, different reviews and things like that. So, 
Um, anyways, next we have David Paul Planchard. If Obama imposes martial law and continues for a third time term, wouldn't he fulfill Revelation 13.5? Well, turn to Revelation 13.5 and we'll see. Revelation 13.5 says here, And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. Well, uh, forty and two months, uh, Obama's already been in for eight years. Okay, so forty and two months is three and a half years. So how would that, I don't understand what a third term, I mean that'd be twelve years. So I don't, you know, no, Obama isn't going to be filling that, and Obama's not the Antichrist either. So, uh, the whole world is not worshiping Obama. So, no. Um, next we have jo Joko Yes 9. I'm not sure if you did already, but would you consider making a video about the Jonathan Kleck channel and his prophecy that still could come to pass in relevance to the prophet whom prophecy and his leading people to think we're all gods. Deuteronomy 13, Jonathan Kleck Bell is even on YouTube and Google. Also on the $100 bill, there is the same bell. Please consider he might be that prophet which giveth a sign and a wonder. Okay, I have no idea about any of that stuff. I've never looked into any of that. Um, somebody else can do that. I you know, have plenty of stuff to, for myself to do. So no, I haven't looked into it and really don't have the time to right now. Sorry. Next we have Shyla Bella. I am an African American Christian. Your videos have really opened my eyes and brought me closer to Jesus. Well, praise the Lord. My question is, if there is no house churches in my area, as a woman, what should I do to start one? Because I feel so alone right now with all that I know, everyone around me, I have a hard time sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ because they are so in with the world, but as a single woman, uh, any suggestions on what I should do or could do? Okay, well, uh, I have a study on the, the isolated Christian in perfection. And uh, I would suggest watching that because I get into a lot of the scriptures, which I can't get into here, a lot of the arguments and things. Um, but I will say the short answer to the long sermon is that uh, we as Christians are supposed to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And many times when you're going to some kind of a church building or house church or you're fellowshipping with other Christians, what happens is that personal relationship with Jesus Christ kind of gets pushed out of the way. And you say, well, I really have some good friends, you know, that are Christians and things like this. And I enjoy fellowshipping with them and we do everything together. But what about your personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Um, I have found from my experience that when you develop your personal relationship with Jesus Christ, when you're content with Him and His fellowship, and you read His Word, and you, and you study His Word, and you pray, and you, you know, uh, give you a scripture here. Um, over in Ephesians. Find the verse here. I think it's in Ephesians. Maybe I'm wrong on that. I'll have to look it up. It's difficult when I'm doing so many different things. Um, to keep, yeah, Ephesians 5.19. It wasn't Ephesians. I must have paged right by it. Yes, okay. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19 speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Um, that's a personal thing there. It's not saying singing among the congregation or among other believers and things. Uh, you're, to, you're to pray to the Lord by yourself. You're to read the Bible, you and Him, reading it there. Um, and you are also to uh, sing hymns to the Lord. And when you do that, that's going to help with a lot of that loneliness that you feel. Um, and I'll get back to the thing of uh, what, to do, what to do about house church in just a minute here. Um, but another place I want to turn to, just to kind of show you the present condition that this world is in, 
Revelation chapter 3. Um, verse 20. The Lord says here, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Okay? So, you can keep reading there too. There's other good promises and things. But um, the point is, Jesus Christ is knocking on the door and He's saying, Let me in. I want to talk to you. Not I want to talk to the group. I want to spend time with the group. I want to talk to you. You develop the personal relationship first. That will help with a lot of the loneliness. That will help with the thing of saying, I want to be around other people and whatever else. Um, after that's done, then, you know, when, when you have that strong personal relationship, um, you know, the Lord will start to bring people into your life. Uh, that has happened with me. It's happened with my wife and I. You know, there's people that are coming along now, and it's like, hey, can we help you? And, and meeting with people and talking with people and things like that. Um, you know, instead of trying to say, I want the fellowship with people first and then the Lord kind of secondary or whatever else, uh, no, you develop the, your walk with the Lord, your relationship with the Lord Jesus first, and then the fellowship comes later. Um, but as far as a house church is concerned, uh, again, it doesn't have to be some kind of a formal thing here or whatever. Um, you develop that personal relationship with the Lord, He might allow you to lead somebody to Him and then disciple that person. And now you're actually going to be meeting with that person on a regular basis and you know, hanging out, if you will, and um, listening to the Bible or preaching together and reading the Bible together and praying together. And then that might grow from there and, and whatever else. Uh, you don't have to feel like, because you're a woman, that, well, how can I start a house church? Well, you know... Um, Another verse I need just came to my mind. It's in the book of Acts. Okay. Acts chapter 16. Just to give you a, a tie-in here, an interesting tie-in. Acts 16. Uh, verse 14 says here, And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized in her household, she brought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. Okay, so here's a woman that basically has a um, house, there and she's inviting them into it. You know, she gets saved and she says, "Hey, come in here." It's her house. All right. Uh, another passage here um, coming to my mind. Uh, let's see. Uh, the second epistle of John, First uh, John, Second John, Third John, the, se the second letter of John there, it says, uh, The elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all they that have known the truth. Um, and it, so John is actually writing to a elect lady, a saved lady, apparently that has a church in her house. All right? It's a, it's a very, very interesting thing there. So, um, could you get to the point where you have a uh, house church uh, with people that you've led to the Lord and people that uh, you know and things like that that would want to come in and hear the truth? Yeah, I think that you can get to that point. I know that there are many people that will just watch us, watch me preach or some other brother that's a King James Bible believer. They'll, they'll watch us on a Sunday morning and then they discuss the sermon afterwards. So, but that would be my recommendation. Um, get to know the Lord first and, and, you know, in the sense of you and Him, you know, read your Bible a lot, pray, sing hymns, learn hymns and things like that. I think that those are all important. And then in time, the Lord will bring people into your midst 
uh, as you develop that strong personal relationship with him and you'll have people to fellowship with, people to disciple. Uh, that's my advice. All right, next we have Sir N. Daniel. Um, Nahum 316, Oxford KJV versus Cambridge KJV. Ready, go. Okay. Um, okay, I'm just looking here. Um, Oxford KJV, apparently. I don't have a, mine's a Cambridge right here, so. But it says here, there's no friend like Jesus says. Uh, the dispute is over the word flayeth, which appears in the Oxford, Oxford Bible, and the word flieth, which appears in the Cambridge. Um, okay, I don't... Okay, you know... Uh, again, you're going to have some, some differences between the Oxford and the Cambridge. You know, there's different things like uh, throughly versus thoroughly. Uh, that's another thing. Um, you know, I, I tend to st stick with the Cambridge Bible, the Cambridge edition. Uh, I'd have to look up this whole thing. Let me just go back there to Nahum 3.16. Nahum 3.16 Thou hast multiplied thy merchants above the stars of heaven. The canker worm spoileth and flieth away. Okay. Uh, you know, this, uh, no friend like Jesus here said that, you know, worms don't fly, they flee. Well, okay, but, you know, if you if somebody takes their flight, you know, you have somebody say, I, I had to take my flight, that does not mean that they flew. That it could, I guess, technically, but... Uh, in the old days, they would say, you know, I took my flight, meaning they left. So, again, you got to be careful with that. Well, the Cambridge is wrong because it says flieth away. Well, not necessarily. Um, you know, I mean, I was late the other day going to the store. I really had to fly. Oh, so you have an airplane? No, I had a car that was driving very fast on the roads. You see? So, uh doesn't mean anything. If that was supposed to be some kind of contradiction or some kind of reason to reject the King James Bible, it wasn't a very good one. Next we have Ben Rainville. Brian, I believe Daniel 9 verse 27 refers to Jesus Christ making the covenant with many. Attributing this passage to the Antichrist was first brought forth by Rome. No, it wasn't. Messiah being cut off after three and a half years would leave only three and a half years left on the final week of years. The time of Jacob's trouble was three and a half years, the Great Tribulation. Also, all through Revelation, this time period comes up as three and a half years, not seven years. Jesus calls the end of the sacrificial system by the, his finished work at the cross. What is your understanding of Daniel 9, 24 through 27? Well, we're going to have to, I'm not going to agree with you on that. Because the, um, the Antichrist comes to power, and for the first three and a half years, um, you know, he's just going forth, conquering and to conquer, and then he sets himself up in the temple halfway through the thing. Um, you know, and that's a, that's a whole big study, you know, give me some scriptures on that. Well, you know, that's a whole sermon in and of itself. I mean, if you go to, we'll go there just for trying to keep these answers fairly short, because it's going to take me forever to get this all done if I don't, but... Um, Daniel 9, verse 27, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even unto the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Well, it's the same man that's doing both there, obviously from the context. He is confirming the covenant for one week. You don't say, well, that's Jesus. And then in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And I guess you're saying that they're both Jesus, that he calls the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Um, but when you compare this to what's going on over in Matthew 24, um, Matthew chapter 24, keep your hand there in Daniel 9, and go to Matthew 24. Uh, 
verse 15, Matthew 24, verse 15, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. When does that happen? In the midst of the week. He sets himself up in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So, to say that this is somehow Jesus and not the Antichrist, uh, no, I don't agree with that. Sorry, but uh, nope. Next we have dot ka, I guess. Um, brother, how to how to understand First John one seven through nine in correlation to First John uh, three nine? Okay, well, well, go there and check that out quick. It's amazing how many people don't understand the plain English that I spoke of one question. See this a couple times now. Right, well, just another question. Uh, I said one. <laughs> you know, if, if people don't quite get that, then I think maybe I'm, maybe I won't be doing these videos in the future. It just kind of is like, whatever. Um, 1 John 3, verse 7 through, or excuse me, 1 John 1. 7 through 9, um, it says, if, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Okay, correlation to 1 John 3, 9. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Okay, um, 1 John 3, 9 is talking about our righteousness that is imputed to us because of what Jesus did on the cross. All right, in terms of your eternal destination, yes, you are sinless. In terms of your fellowship with the Lord, that's a different story. 1 John chapter 1, verse 6 is where you need to read. Okay, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. It does not say anything about eternal salvation in 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1 verses 6 down through 10 is about staying in fellowship in the right relationship. 1 John chapter 3 verse 9 is talking about your eternal salvation. Okay, Our sins are paid for at the cross. Past, present, future sins are paid for. So in terms of where you're going to go for, for all of eternity, if you're saved, you go to heaven. Okay, But in terms of your fellowship with the Lord, that's a different story. Uh, it plainly says in verse 6 in chapter 1. So chapter 1 is talking about fellowship. Chapter 3 is talking about your eternal destination. Second question, which, epistle, which epistles are doctrinally for the church today? I know about the letter to the Hebrews and James. These are letters to the Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble, but is there other lists for this period? I mean, 2 Timothy 2.15 um, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rather dividing the word of truth, and how to understand 1 Peter 4.18. Well, 1 Peter 4.18, look that up. And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? All right, well, um, you know, it's talking about the time has come, verse 17, the judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end of be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Well, you know, as far as which books are for the Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble, um, obviously Hebrews and James, definitely a lot of the book of Revelation is, is for the time of Jacob's trouble saints. Um, but as far as like First Peter, Second Peter, First, Second, Third John, Jude, you know, uh, some of those books... It's iffy. I've heard arguments both ways and things. Um, there's definitely some stuff there that looks like it's for people in the time of Jacob's trouble. Other things definitely apply to us, you know, as Christians today. So honestly, I don't have a real great definition of that type of a thing. Um, I know the Pauline epistles are definitely for us, and that's what I stick with. Romans through Philemon, um, that's where we're going to get our doctrine at today. You can read those and apply anything in any of those passages 
uh, to us today as far as, uh, you know, instruction for a Christian. All right. Stasia R. I think I'm saying your name right. I hope I'm saying it right. Um, how can a saint address lingering sin of the flesh? Well, um, I would say that that depends on how long you've been saved. Uh, if you just are recently saved, uh, you're going to have some struggles getting over some things, getting victory over sin. Okay, there's that's going to be there. Um, the classic passage to go to is, is uh, Romans chapter 7. Um, start at verse 14. It says here, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do I allow not. For what I would, that do I not, but what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. So that really describes well the fight between your flesh and the spirit. And you're going to have that thing there, you know, talking about lingering sin. After you get saved, you're going to have those struggles there with different types of sins. Um, and it might take you a couple of years to get victory over those sins. Uh, and there are certainly things that you can do in your life that those sins are not going to go away very quickly. Uh, Christians, a lot of Christians don't take the thing of occult items uh, seriously. They just think, oh, I'm saved, I'm born again, you know, I'm washed in the blood of the Lamb, you know, uh, this, and they then they think to themselves that because the Lord's forgiven you and your righteousness is imputed to you and you're part of the body of Christ and everything, that you can somehow just leave accursed items around your home and it's not going to affect you. Uh, that's not true. Um, I would say that one of the reasons, a big reason that a lot of Christians have problems in the flesh is because they... Uh, have occult type things around. Um, I know I had um, Hollywood movies, and those are really, really bad, uh, made by people that hate God and everything. So it was like, I got to get rid of those. I burned them. It isn't, you know, sell them on eBay and get some good money or something. No, burn them. Um, heavy metal, rock and roll type of stuff. Burn that, get rid of that. Uh, any kind of like a dream catcher, those are really bad. Um, occult type items like charm bracelets, uh, um, any kind of occult talismans, lucky rabbit's foot, um, you know, things like that. Hmm? Rings, stickers. Yeah, certain rings and stickers and things like that. Anything dealing with witches or wizards or spell casting, uh, lucky charms of any kind, um, things for good luck or things like that. I actually heard somebody say the one time that good luck was actually uh, a derivative luck is is derived excuse me luck is derived from the word Lucifer so never really checked into that much but I think that there could be some truth to that but uh, get rid of occult things um, if there's been occultism in your family then just pray to the Lord and ask him to cut any kind of ties to that stuff and and whatever um, get that stuff out of your life uh, you know there's a lot of things that will that will prohibit you from fighting sin on a, on a level where you need to. Um, you know, of course, if you're listening to the wrong kind of music, if you watch television, you know, any of that type of stuff, too, will give you a really hard time fighting sins of the flesh. And it will diminish the power that you could have in your life through the Lord. Because you're basically giving Satan a foothold into your life. So I would say, number one, um, give it time. Pray about it. Um, at the more you read the Bible... Um, the more easily you're going to understand God's Word. 
uh, you're, the more you hide God's Word in your heart, the more spiritual power you're going to have. Uh, so it's going to take time, number one. Number two, clean up your life. That's sanctification, setting yourself apart from the world, uh, separating yourself um, from worldly practices, from evil, from things like that. It takes time, is the whole thing. And you're always going to have that struggle with the flesh. And Paul, later on, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we've talked about this a couple times now, some of these other questions, he still had struggles with his flesh. He had a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet him. So um, I can attest to that. Even though I've gotten rid of a lot of the, well, everything occult, you know, base that I owned, I've gotten rid of all that. I don't have uh, very much anymore that is even borderline evil in any way. And I mean, I shouldn't even say evil, I should say secular. Um, pretty much everything in this place here is um, something that I wouldn't be ashamed at all if the Lord physically manifested himself at the front door and came in, I wouldn't be ashamed for him to look around. Um, that's a good question to ask yourself, you know. Um, what would you feel weird about if the Lord actually physically came to your house? where you're at. Is there anything in your home that you wouldn't want him to see? And if so, he is seeing it. So give it time. Cleanse your home and things like that. Read the, the Bible. Pray. Uh, listen to the right kind of music. And you'll eventually get victory over that sin. Okay. Kristen Buchholz. Brian, sorry for bringing so long. I needed to provide facts for my question. Blessings. Okay, I don't see the question, but uh, maybe it'll be down further, I guess. I don't know. Uh, Hebrews 12.29 says, Brian, I do have one question. That is, there's a movement called open theism that denies that omniscience of God and denies the original sin before they believe that only your past sins are forgiven. Therefore, salvation is based upon your obedience. How would you refute them? They're getting very big among street preachers. Yeah, it's kind of funny because the Catholics are pretty much taking over the street preaching thing. It's it's all works based, you know. Uh, definitely, I see that. Um, Levi Price and things. Some of these guys, you know, and they got the they wear these big shirts that have Jesus real big, you know, or repent of sin on it and stuff like this. And you get to talking to them, and it's just like I'm crucifying my flesh on a daily basis now. And, and I don't believe in eternal security because that's an evil, wicked thing that justifies your sins. And, and it's all about them. That's the interesting thing. Uh, it's, you know, I mean, there's so many verses to refute the whole movement. It's just, it's ridiculous. I mean, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it's not by works, you know, that, that you've done. Uh, you know, it's it just, where do I even begin on that, <laughs> you know? I mean, I'll just, well, I'll just go to Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Um, it's very simple. You know, I mean, if, if you save yourself, then you're not relying on Jesus Christ. It's not his work. That saves you. It's your works. So, uh, I mean, pretty much any verse that, that talks about... Um, the Lord saving you can refute their whole stupid system. I mean, they can come up with all this little, you know, it's kind of interesting that they would say about the original sin uh, that denies the omniscience of God and denies the original sin. Therefore, they believe that only your past sins are forgiven. Therefore, salvation is based upon your obedience. How would you refute them? That's, that's Catholicism. You have to die in a state of grace. You know, is it continue, you know, I am being saved. That's all that that thing is. They're just, they're Catholics is all that it is. Um, oh. Titus chapter 3, verse 5, another good one. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us by the wa washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. God saves us. We don't save ourselves. But if you really want to nail these papists to the wall... This is the one that no papist can answer, uh, whether they claim to be Bible-believing papists or Roman Catholic papists. Um, 
Romans chapter 4, verse 6. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. God imputes righteousness without works? Hmm. See, no Catholic can handle the doctrine of imputation. Right? You want a real Bible doctrine, not all this other little funny stuff, open theism and stuff like this. Imputation. Okay? Imputed righteousness. All right, if you want a good definition of imputation, we'll stop. We'll be right back here to Romans chapter 4. Keep your hand there, but go to um, Philemon. Philemon chapter 1, verse 18. If he hath wronged thee or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. That's what Paul is writing about. You know, he's writing it to Philemon about Philemon's bondservant Onesimus. But it's a perfect description of what the Lord did for us. You know, what Lord Jesus Christ did. We have wronged God. We owe God for living in sin down here. But Jesus Christ came and he took his sins and he put them upon himself. You know, we've wronged God, but it, it was put on the account of Jesus Christ. So, back to Romans chapter 4. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you're taking his sinless, perfect, righteous life and his death on the cross, and you're exchanging it for your life of wickedness. So his righteousness is imputed to you. It's without works. You don't have to continue to do good works and things to stay saved and whatever else. That's heresy. Uh, it's, it's literally spitting in the face of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. It's saying, I can save myself. And it's ironic because, uh, again, that's exactly what the Jesuit order teaches. If you look at the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius de Loyola, um, you know, I'm making fun of his name, of course, but... Uh, you know, if you look at their spiritual exercises, that's exactly what they teach. You come to the cross and you look at the, the sufferings of Christ and then you say, I want to combine my sufferings with his sufferings and stuff. It's Jesuitry. I mean, the highest mind control level of Jesuitry that was written by the very founder of the Jesuit order, uh, that's exactly what they preach and teach, that you suffer, you merit salvation. And in fact, you can suffer so much that not only are you saving yourself, but you can also merit the salvation of other people because you're suffering on such a level. You look at the Philippines and things like this, and they'll actually have guys walking down the streets flagellating their backs, whipping their backs with chains and things like this until the blood's just running down their backs. They'll literally put them on the cross and crucify them. They don't pound nails through their hands or anything, but they'll hang there on the cross, and they'll whip them and they'll beat them until they're bleeding. Yeah. I've been to uh, Costa Rica, and there were Catholics that would, uh, you know, come and they would, they would, you know, walk on their bare knees, or not walk, but crawl on their bare knees the whole way up, you know, a marble floor, maybe a hundred feet or so up to the altar where they would do all their little Hail, Hail Marys and whatever other pagan repetitive prayers they have. They would do that. Why? They're suffering. It's pain. I'm meriting my salvation. See. Let's continue here in Romans chapter 4, verse uh, 7 and 8. Saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Okay. Look at... Uh, um, verse 21 of the same chapter. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Talking about Abraham. Um, now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us, us also to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. So imputation is something that Catholics can't handle because it totally obliterates their self-righteousness. You know, there's your, your self-righteousness, your goodness, has no part in your salvation. All right? So, that's how I would answer that. Okay, next we have Dan Jensen. 
What did David mean in Psalm 122, verse 1? I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. Thank you. Um, well, very simple. They had a synagogue back then. Uh, they did have the house of the Lord back in the Old Testament. We don't anymore. Uh, what did Jesus do to the temple, um, you know, the physical temple, when he died on the cross? The veil between the outside and the Holy of Holies went and ripped from the top to the bottom, showing it was God doing it from top. He's in heaven, man's on earth, ripped it right down the half, in half, like that. That's why you read in Acts chapter 7, you know, Stephen is telling them, you know, God doesn't dwell in the temple anymore. So the house of the Lord that he's talking about there was the Old Testament temple, but it's been done away with. Unless you're a Baptist or something like that, then you just pretend that the, like a Roman Catholic would, that replacement theology, that the church today has replaced the promises that God had for Israel in the Old Testament. You just kind of bring it, Old Testament goes and molds into New Testament Christianity. Praise God is the next uh, person here. Should Christians debate atheists on the existence of God? Most of the time nothing comes of it, but many people do come to the Lord after these debates. I would question that. Many people do come to the Lord after these debates. Um, we are not to bring people to the Lord through science or through evidence or things like that. Uh, the more sure word uh, that we have is because of prophecy. I'll show you that verse real quickly here. Um, bringing people to the Lord through, you know, confirming the word with science and things like this. Uh, we're, the just shall live by faith. Okay? Um, and if you want proof of something, then uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19 says, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto, whereunto ye do well, that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day, day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scriptures is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. All right. So, uh, prophecy is one of the ways that we can prove the Bible. Um, but to say, debating with atheists and stuff like this, uh, eh, it's kind of shaky at best. I'll show you why I say that another um, another reason I say that oh boy I cannot think of where that one verse is let me look it up quickly Okay, I'm thinking of another verse in Proverbs, but uh, Psalm, Psalm 14, verse 1 says, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. They, are, they have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. God says that atheists are fool, fools. Excuse me. And Proverbs 23, verse 9 says, Speak not in the ears of a fool, for he will despise the wisdom of thy words. So when you have an atheist, I mean, it's one thing if you have an atheist that's just saying, I don't, is there any proof for God? I don't know anything about the Bible. I don't really know what to believe. It's more of an agnostic, really. But if you have somebody that was raised like in a communistic country or something, um, okay, talk to them. But when you get somebody that's just an outright total atheist, hating God, hating the Bible, They've been reproved over and over and over again. They've seen proof. They've, they've, people try to witness to them, and they just hate God, and they'll actually look at the Bible, trying to find errors and stuff like that. Don't waste your time on them. Uh, that's, I, I've you know, spoken against atheism, and they come out and they, you know, and stuff like this. I don't waste any time with them. 
uh, I've, what I'll do with somebody like that is I'll say, are you a sinner? They'll never say yes. The, it's always, well, I'm not a sinner, you know, well, you know, I, I reject your Bible, I reject that. They're self-righteous, that's all they are. And that's where I leave the whole thing. So, I don't waste time debating atheists. Next we have Alan Bender, 1 Timothy 5.23. Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. Please explain your take on this verse. How was Paul's education... Or how has Paul's education made him qualified to give Timothy advice? Okay, uh, please explain my take on this verse. I'll do that first. Well, as I've said in other, another one of the comment answers, um, real wine that's made from fermented grape juice that does not have any chemicals, toxins, uh, synthetic uh, types of things in it, you know, Real true wine is fermented grape juice. That means there's bacteria that gets into it. Bacteria, there are harmful bacteria, and there are good bacteria. Okay, fermented food um, is will have good bacteria in it, and the good bacteria, if there's any bad, that the, the good will kill that off. Uh, sauerkraut is another type of fermented food. Yogurt is a type that has bacteria in it. Fermented food again. Uh, very, very good for you. And I don't mean like a Yo Play or some of these fake, you know, store bought yogurts that are like really high in sugar and all kinds of food coloring and fake fruit flavors and things like that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about whole milk yogurt. Then you can look on the back and it says it has these different, you know, helpful bacteria, acidophilus and some of this other stuff like that. Um, uh, kefir is another dairy product that has helpful bacteria in it. And so it is with uh, real true wine. Wine in small amounts is good for you. Um, I don't say that, you know, I personally can get my bacteria elsewhere. I stay away from alcohol um, just because to me it's a bad testimony. And I've seen what alcohol has done to people. And so I just am like, nah, no, I'm not really into that. And, you know, red wine can also give you headaches. Um, so it's, it's, it's tricky. I mean, we have, uh, we have made our own grape juice. You know, we've, we bought uh, Concord grapes last year. We bought some and we, we have a little, you know, an old uh, strainer thingy, you know, that you turn, uh, what's Victorio strainer, I think. And, you know, we just put the grapes right in there. We don't even heat them up or anything. We just put them right in there so they're raw and just grind them and it, it removes the seeds and a lot of the pulp from the juice. It kind of squeezes out the juice and you get this really, really good tasting grape juice. Now, if we let that sit for a little while, it would start to ferment. And there's, of course, you can get uh, different types of bacteria types of things like whey and W-H-E-Y. Uh, there's other types of things that you can get to, to put helpful bacteria into products like that. And uh, it'll get kind of almost a carbonated uh, flavor to it, kind of like a little bit bitey, you know. And um, there's a whole, that's a whole other thing there. So what Paul was recommending for Timothy is you need to get a little bit of helpful bacteria um, into your system. And the other part of your question there is, how has Paul's education made him qualified to give Timothy advice? Well, um, I don't know exactly, I, I don't want to misrepresent what you're trying to say there, but I think I might be understanding where you're going with that, and that is Paul was raised as a Pharisee. He was not a medical doctor, so why would he be educated and qualified to, to make an assessment of Timothy's health? Well, you see, uh, that's a big problem because our, your health is your responsibility, and we have gotten way far away from this. Um, back in the early 1900s, this whole big pharmaceutical medical establishment thing started to come around. I mean, there were very few hospitals back then, and the pharmaceutical industry was just small local pharmacies, and they were giving a lot of natural healing types of things. But you see, natural healing is something that anybody can do. You know, if I tell you that go pick these herbs out there in the field over there, and that'll help your headache or it'll help your upset stomach or whatever else, I'm not going to make money. Love of money is the root of all evil, you know? And so the pharmaceutical industry coming along and, and having all their patent medicines and drugs, 
they have basically rewritten what health is supposed to be. And they control the medical schools, they control the medical establishment, uh, they control the government, essentially. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry is the most powerful um, organism of Satanism, Satan <laughs> uh, on the entire planet. So to say, and I don't know if this is what you're trying to say by that, but how is Paul qualified? Um, we're all supposed to be qualified to tell people how to be healthy, how to cure certain diseases. Um, that's not supposed to be some official uh, thing, realm of only the trained medical professionals. That's nonsense, absolute total nonsense. Um, your health is your responsibility, and it's uh, the majority of your health can be fixed just by changing your nutrition. Uh, not even herbal supplements or things like that. You don't need that stuff unless you're really sick or unless you need a little bit more of this or that. If you just fix up your nutrition and you're saved and you get exercise, most of your health problems are going to go away. And if you're on pharmaceutical drugs, you need to get off them things as quickly as possible because they are 100% pure poison. Uh, there's nothing good in a pharmaceutical pill. Okay, And you say, well, what about plant-based cellulose? Well, how do they get the plant-based cellulose? Okay, you can look into that. I mean, they're, they're using acids and stuff like that to process the cellulose, to process starch. There's nothing good about the pharmaceutical industry. So to say, well, you know, you have to be qualified, that's part of the propaganda that the pharmaceutical industry came up with through the medical schools and now through the hospitals. The whole system is a complete farce. It's completely fake. So, okay, continuing. Next one, IDK. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 22. What does anathema, maranatha, really mean? I don't know the true meaning of each word, nor then combined. If you have the time, forgive me. Do you think that Mark 10, 30, a world to come eternal life, debunks the idea that the unpardonable sin is limited to when Jesus Christ is on the earth? Um, as in that world being eternity and not the millennial. God bless you and your family until the catching away. Well, anathema, uh, maranatha, means basically damned. Anathema is like you're cursed, you're damned. Maranatha at his coming. So uh, anathema, maranatha would mean damned at his coming. I'll show you where that's at in Scripture. If you don't know. Um... Trying to think of where this is. Okay, it's oh, you actually have it there. I was thinking of something else. Not too bright sometimes, you know. First Corinthians chapter 16, verse 22. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema maranatha. Okay. Um, anathema maranatha means damned at his coming. That's what that means. Uh, so, uh, Mark 10, verse 30. But he shall receive an hundredfold uh, now in this time houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the world to come eternal life. Um, when Jesus says about the unpardonable sin cannot be forgiven in this world or in the world to come, uh, I do believe it's talking about when Jesus was physically on the earth. I don't believe that this verse somehow uh, does away with that. Um, yeah, I don't. I wouldn't agree with that, that uh, this verse could somehow disprove the thing of the unpardonable sin being when Jesus is physically present on the earth. Just my take on it. Next we have Zach Phillips, Revelation 4, 7. What do you think about the four beasts being the four Gospels? No, I don't think so. I've not heard that one before. Uh, the four beasts being the four Gospels. Uh, I don't know how that would make any sense. Um, 
I don't really know what to say about that other than no. I don't agree with that. Adam Shu, what are your thoughts on the mega hit new Pokemon Go game? It's the fastest growing and most popular game today, and it and is it harmless or from the devil himself? Thanks. Well, Pokemon is a very um, it's veiled witchcraft. Uh, I have a book. I'm not going to get it right now, but it's by a woman named Doreen Irvine, and she was the queen of black witches back in the 1950s. And uh, she was saying that she went to a world council of witches way back when, and they said, you know, we need to come up with a way to make witchcraft more palatable to the average person. Um, John Ronald Rule Tolkien was one of the first to introduce a lot of the secrets of witchcraft into the mainstream culture uh, with his Lord of the Rings, uh, Hobbit, the whole Lord of the Rings series and things. And it was like, okay, it was somewhat received, but they wanted to make witchcraft a lot more popular. And, of course, you look after the 1950s, witchcraft, there was an explosion. You had Bewitched coming out, and then it was just like, after that, it was just cartoons and TV shows. Sabrina the Teenage Witch, and now it's Charmed, and all this other satanic filth, and uh, promoting witchcraft. And um, Pokemon is just another one of those things. It's, uh, you know, elements of earth, wind, fire and all this other stuff and and you can have you can cast spells and you can get power and everything else so this pokemon go thing from everything i've seen of it it just is is putting people into this illusionary world of i'm going to make you know my reality is going to be a video game now or something uh it's quite absurd uh honestly and um of course you know it's it's also leading towards the Mark of the Beast thing because you're going to have, you have to have your iPhone to play Pokemon Go and you're being tracked wherever you're going and you're giving in all kinds of personal information to be part of this thing. And so the idea of I'm being tracked wherever I'm going is now becoming trendy and popular and cool and wouldn't it be better to even have a chip in you and then you wouldn't even need your iPhone. You could just kind of walk around and you're in the game and so, it's demonic, definitely. Uh, Terry Wonder says, Could you please explain why so many say that we are now living in the kingdom of Jesus, coming back to rule and reign is already happening? I guess it lines up with the pre, pre, pre-terrorism on millennial view. Yeah, it does. It does. Uh, Catholicism is the big proponent of that. The book of Revelation was fulfilled in 70 A.D., um, and then the millennial king has come in and Christ is ruling and reigning on the earth through the Pope. Uh, I don't think so. Um, you know, so why are there so many? Well, because of, that's what the Catholic Church teaches and people fall for it. But if you listen to my study on premillennialism, you'll see scripture after scripture after scripture proving that Jesus Christ is going to physically be on the earth for a thousand years. And... You know, it's kind of easy to debunk the whole amillennial position because we're way past a thousand years, you know, since 70 A.D. If Revelation happened in 70 A.D., uh, then the end of the world would have been in 1070, you know, a thousand years after 70 A.D. So, and of course, you know, being the Catholic system, they'll say, uh, well, it's symbolic. A thousand years doesn't really mean a thousand years. and Yes, it does. Next, we have Romans 3.25. Hello, Brian. What do you think about the seven churches of Revelation? Uh, what about the church Thyatira? Is the church going to be in Jacob's uh, trouble? And what about the ten virgins in Matthew 25? Who are those unwise virgins? This question above is a combined one question because I know something... Someone who is learning that half of the church will be left behind after the rapture, although they are saved. Greetings from the Netherlands. God's grace upon you and your family. Have a blessed and wonderful day. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, the let's see if we can go here real quick. Uh, my closest to Matthew chapter 25 is where you read about the ten wise and the ten foolish virgins. And I've talked about that in plenty of other studies. The, excuse me, the ten virgins, the five wise, five foolish. Excuse me, I say it that way. Matthew 25, verse 1. 
Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. They're not going out to marry the bridegroom. Okay, this is talking about saints in the time of Jacob's trouble. It, is not, it does not have one reference to the church, which is described as a chaste virgin, singular. Jesus Christ is marrying a one bride, not ten. All right? Um, and it's talking about the kingdom of heaven, which is the millennial kingdom. So at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, you're going to have, you know, they have instructions there that they're supposed to be looking for Jesus Christ. How do you know that? Well, let's go up to Matthew chapter 24. Um, verse 46, Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. All right, and you can start actually in verse 42. I'm not going to for sake of time, but Matthew 24 verses 42 down through 51 tells you about that they're going to have to be looking for Jesus Christ at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. And of course the question would come up, well, if it's seven years after the Antichrist signs the peace treaty, wouldn't they know the exact day and hour and everything else? No, because, um, where's the verse here? Verse 22 of Matthew chapter 24 says, And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake those days shall be shortened. So the Lord is going to supernaturally shorten the days there towards the end of the time of Jacob's trouble so that they're not going to know the day or the hour when Jesus is coming back. Okay, they'll know the year. I do believe that they'll know the year, but they're not going to be sure about the day or the hour. All right, and it's going to be very, very bad. I mean, if you get away from any kind of a weekly schedule for a while, you'll start to forget what day it is. Sometimes you'll forget what month it is. I mean, you'll just be like, what is today? You know, I mean, you go on a camping trip for a couple days and you don't really have a watch or anything with you and you are and you go to come back and it's like, what day is it today? I think it's Saturday. I thought it was Friday. I don't know. You know, well, tor towards the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, I mean, everything's falling apart, you know, sun and stars, you know, sun, the moon and going dark and stars falling from heaven and powers of the, of the heavens being shaken and all this bad stuff happening. They're going to lose track of time, and they're going to have to watch for the Lord to come. And so it goes, Jesus is talking in there in chapter 24, verses 42 down through 51, about having to watch at the end, and then he goes and he tells a parable explaining it further. Okay, He's not saying chapter 24 is for the time of Jacob's trouble, and now chapter 24 is somehow symbolic of Christians. Uh, no, chapter 25 is him further explaining what he was just gotten done saying there in chapter 24. Um, as far as the thing of uh, the churches, the seven churches in Revelation, uh, there's some pretty good arguments that they're actually um, going to be there in the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, there's some stuff there that's kind of interesting. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of debate back and forth on that, to be quite honest with you. So, um, the whole point is, though, that there's not anybody that's going to be, you know, if you're part of the body of Christ, you're going up at the rapture. Teaching a split rapture is completely unbiblical. Uh, you're not going to find that in any of the passages that talk about the, the catching away. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 through 58. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. Read those passages. John chapter 10, there's uh, in the early part of John chapter 10, it's talking about the rapture. Um, there's nothing about part of the fold being left and part being taken and things like this. No. If you're part of the body of Christ, you're going up. So, D.O. says, Brian, I have had conversations with a brother in Christ whom, when we disagree in a few areas of Scripture, states that he believes the Lord gives us different interpretations based on his, God's will for us. Uh, and where we will, we are in our walk with Christ. I feel this can be a dangerous view to have. Second Peter 1.20, what are your thoughts? Okay, well, Second Peter 1.20 would be no prophecy of the Scriptures of any private interpretation. 
pretty sure that's what it is. Let me just check. Yeah. Um, well, I will say that there's multiple applications of Scripture, uh, certainly. But to say that everybody has their own truth and God reveals their own, you know, his different truths to, to different people and things, uh, no, no. Um, that's, that's real dangerous. I'll show you why here. Um, Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Let your converse, and only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you, or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. We're supposed to be in one mind. We're supposed to be in agreement. Uh, chapter 2, verse 1. Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in loneliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 is the same thing. Go there very quickly. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. So we are supposed to have the same mind. When the Holy Spirit comes, He guides us into all truth. So you have somebody saying, well, He's guided me into a different truth than your truth. No, no, no. I mean, there are some things that we can agree to disagree on. Uh, certain days worshiping holiday or, or worshiping on certain days or holidays or things like that Romans chapter 14 talks about that uh, one eats meat one eats herbs okay you know um, there's different things we can just agree to disagree on I'm probably going to do a ser sermon on that someday but uh, doctrine no no we're supposed to be in agreement